Okay, hello everyone. I think it's time to start now. Uh, this is advanced webinar uh, on data analysis tool for high resolution air quality data sets. Uh, this is a three session webinar series. Uh, in and if you can see my slide, uh, you will see that there are session one, which is today, where we'll introduce some of these air quality data sets. We'll also talk and go through a web uh, website to download the aerosol data, which we will use in session two, using the Python script to read, extract, and map those data. In the session three, we'll use similar Python tools to read and extract, map uh, data from only sensors, which is uh, provides uh, data on NO2 and SO2 uh, for various air quality application. And in session three, we will also go over some of the new recently launched and upcoming air quality satellite missions. Uh, I will briefly want to show the website where we have uh, the website for this webinar series. And if you can see my screen, this is the page where uh, I hope everybody has registered through this page. Uh, to attend this webinar and it provides you all the details but it also provides all the instructions to install the python some of the pre rack and then presentations for today as well as for the uh, next two three uh, sessions both presentation slides and exercise and instructions are available uh, in english and in spanish as well so please Make sure you check this website for any updates and to download any data sets or to exercise and presentations uh, for this webinar series. So this is your to, to go uh, resource uh, for this webinar series. Now let's start today's presentation. Today we are going to do uh, Introduction to Remote Sensing of Air Quality. Uh, my name is Pawan Gupta. I'm here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, works on air quality and aerosols data uh, retrieval from satellite. Uh, I have Dr. Melanie Hallett Cook, who is also a scientist here. She focuses more on air quality issues using uh, trace gases and as well as aerosols plus modeling of uh, uh, air quality. <coughs> We also have Brock Welvin and Elizabeth, who is supporting uh, in various uh, technical writing part and uh, coordinating the entire training program. So please uh, feel free to ask question if you have from any one of us uh, in the question answers window, which is provided through this webinar series. Uh, webinar. Uh, and then some of the questions will take uh, after we finish the presentations uh, one by one. So with that introduction, uh, the learning objective for this presentations are uh, outline aerosols. Uh, we'll provide the outline of aerosols and trace course product in two days. And then we'll also identify some of the potential applications uh, in air quality monitoring where you can actually use some of these tools which we will show in uh, week two and week three. Uh, not exactly the same uh, analysis, but at least you will be able to modify those Python script to perform those type of analysis. And then definitely we'll describe some of these tools to read those data sets and we'll download uh, some of the results into this presentation as well. So to start with, uh, Traditionally, air quality monitoring is performed using these ground measurements, and these ground measurements instruments includes all type of methods, uh, starting with collecting the air uh, f uh, particles on the filters, making the measurement in the lab, uh, and then there are other instruments which makes optical measurements where uh, they either send laser slide or they are based on the uh, how these particles reflect or scattered incoming solar radiation. 
Apart from the ground measurements, uh, there are two other components in modern days of air quality monitoring and management program plays very important roles. One are models. Models are important. If you want to predict the air quality for tomorrow or for in five days in advance, you will need models. You cannot do just alone with the ground measurements. And in recent time, observations from aircraft and satellites have really complemented these two tools, ground measurements model, to either fill the gaps or to advance or to provide a priori information to model for weather forecast for better forecasting of air quality. Satellite is the one of the component of this really huge air quality management program. And we are going to focus this webinar series on some of the data sets available from the satellite sensor, which you can use to perform your own air quality analysis. So why do we want to use the satellite data? What you get from the satellite is a measurement of radiance, spectral radiance. Again, uh, I want to stop here and want to make sure that everybody has So if you have not taken, please do that even after this webinar, this session. And that will really help you because in this webinar series, we are not going to go into details of fundamental of satellite remote sensing, how different things work, but we are going to talk more about the data and their applications. So uh, we will give some brief introduction into this webinar uh, session, but still in order to benefit uh, at highest level from this webinar series, please, please go through those fundamentals if you have not done that. Uh, with that, so what you get from the satellite is these true color images. These are spectral radiance measured by the satellite. And specifically in this case, this is a, a modis terra image showing uh, part of the world uh, <coughs> on a given day. And what you see here is different atmospheres land and ocean features uh, which are visible in this image. So the first job of satellite remote, when the data is observed by the satellite and it comes to the ground, the first job is to identify these different features in this true color imageries or in this radiance data. And what are those features? They are basically, uh, you can see the clouds, uh, very white uh, features. You can see snow, which looks similar as clouds. But if you look more closely, you will see there are structure in the snow, uh, which is not there in the cloud. So the textures and, uh, and there are other spectral information like temperature can be used to distinguish between the snow and cloud, although, although they look very similar from the eyes. You can also see some brownish stuff, which is aerosols over both and land. Uh, there are clouds over oceans and over land. They look sometimes different and sometimes very similarly. There are some other features in this image, which is like a very bright spot over the ocean. On the bottom of this image, it's called a glint. It, it's up here because of the specular reflection of the sunlight from the very, uh, from the ocean surface. And then there are black areas, which are basically a data gap. Uh, and this data gap actually varies by different sensors. So depending on which satellite sensor you are using, this data gap can be large or small. And also it varies, as you can see, uh, it's the gaps are larger in the tropics. As you move away from the tropics and go at high latitude, uh, your gaps will start reducing. So again, it varies. Uh, based on different sensors. Uh, there are sensors which does not have any gaps, and there are sensors which has more than this gap. So pay attention to all this uh, small details when you start using the satellite data for any air quality application. Once you get those radiance measurements, uh, you combine those radiance measurements with physics a priori information, and we have to make a lot of assumptions in order to retrieve a geophysical parameter which is in this case, we are going to use the aerosol optical depth as an example, which are used for to address certain air quality monitoring aspect. But this whole process is a, I have presented here in very simple terms, 
but this is called a retrieval algorithm process so where we take satellite measurements combined with a prior information radio transfer calculation and come up with a retrieval algorithm which produce a final geophysical parameter temperature wind speed uh, water vapor amount in that mass cloud optical depth all these are ge example of geophysical parameter which you can get from the satellite and we will focus in this presentation uh, on that there are a couple of uh, three different Different product. One is aerosol optical depth, and then the NO2 and SO2 to make measurement of to assess the uh, uh, trace gas quantity in the atmosphere. So, what is the advantage of using satellite data? Why the satellite provide this global view uh, from top from the space, which is almost impossible to get from the surface. So, what you see here in this map is a seasonal mean aerosol optical depth uh, maps acquired from MODIS aqua satellite in different season and what you see here all this uh, red colors are actually you can identify different aerosols type in different season in different part of the world so you can see the pollution and dust in the spring coming out from the Asia you can see the a smoke pollution or the smoke coming out from the fires in the South America and Southern Africa and during the fall you can also see the dust storm coming out of the Africa you can see haze and pollution even in the northeast in the eastern part of the US specifically during the summertime and there are biomass burning in the sub-saharan region uh, which produce huge smoke and combination of dust and smoke in that region. So this view of uh, global view of aerosol optical depth uh, is really impossible to get it from the surface, uh, and that's what we get from the space. So one questions arise very uh, frequently is how how do we know what satellite is provide what satellite providing aerosol optical depth is accurate or not accurate or how much error it has so in order to do that NASA has this very dense network of uh, Sun photometer it's called Aeronet and there are about 400 plus Aeronet making continuous observations of same quantity called aerosol optical depth from all around the world every 10 to 15 minutes in various different channels which are also available in the satellite so this is the tool to check the accuracies to improve the algorithm and to validate the satellite product so this is very very important to keep in mind that this aeronet measurements provides you aerosol optical depth measurement which are fundamental quantity and considered as ground truth to validate the satellite observations so satellite we just don't retrieve or make measurement with satellite we continuously validate them using this huge network which is an essential part of uh, satellite remote sensing of air quality and other applications so how does the validation looks if you this is just an example and uh, I'm giving you this example because you can actually do some of these analysis using the codes or the Python script which we'll do in week two and week three uh, at your own location uh, find your own location nearest to you uh, aeronet location and you can do actually similar analysis so on this this is just showing a comparison of aeronet and modis globally and you can see the bias is about close to zero uh, with correlation coefficients is very high of course there is a scattered and that's what we uh, uh, that's why we are continuously working to improve to make that a scatter close to one to one line okay with that uh, I would like to stop here for a minute and then we'll go over a couple of questions here just to see where we stand uh, so and these questions may not be necessarily covered in this presentation so far but they might be uh, they might you might you may need to have that kind of knowledge to understand and to go through the week two and week three so that uh, so let me ask you this first question which is related to your coding experience so do you have any experience in computer coding in any language uh, and you have 20 seconds to respond to
Okay, so this is also good. People who have, uh, there are still 13% people who said they have not completed or they don't have any experience. Please, please do go over the website, which I showed in the beginning. There are, is link to a one hour session on fundamental assault at remote sensing. Please go over that session. It will help you a lot in understanding the session two and three specifically when we start looking into the data. It is really, really important to understand the data sets uh, before you start using because there are a lot of if and buts and there are a lot of things which needs to be understood before you start using satellite data for any application. Okay, so let's move on to the presentation. Uh, now, what I'm going to go over is some of the examples of the application which you will be able to perform using the codes which we are going to run in week two and three, not ex necessarily exactly in the same format, but those codes will provide you a guidance to perform this kind of analysis. Uh, you, will you will require to do some modification on those codes to exactly do these tasks, but they will help you. Okay, so the first thing is we like to get this when you talk about the pollution, the particulate matter, PM2.5 is one of the peak uh, air pollutant which is uh, causing a lot of health impact all around the world. And people would like to see how we can use satellite data to estimate that surface level PM2.5. And this movie actually is just showing an example of how this satellite derived aerosol optical depth which is shown as the maps color coded maps as a contour and then you have this vertical walls coming out from the ground which are showing the ground measurements of pm 2.5 and you can see that when the aerosol optical depth values are high you still see high values of pm 2.5 from the measured end now so this gives you some signal that these two quantities might be different but they have some kind of relationship and that's what we want to understand and want to extract from the satellite data. So in order to look that, let me give you a very brief explanation of these two quantity and how they are similar and different. Both make measurements of aerosol particles in the atmospheres. Aerosol optical depth represent the entire column of the atmosphere from the surface to the satellite height or top of the atmosphere. Also, the satellite derived aerosol optical depth are averaged over a horizontal spatial resolution. In case of MODIS, it is 10 kilometer spatial resolution. They also have a product at 3 kilometer resolutions, and there are high resolution product as well. PM2.5 is measured at the surface, uh, and these are usually measured either optical measurements or the samplers and they represent the concentration of particles in the surface layer only near the surface. So this is one difference between column versus surface, optical versus a physical mass quantity. PM2.5 is also a dry mass. It is uh, measured in a controlled condition with, where the relative humidity is controlled to 35%, whereas the aerosol optical depth represent the ambient conditions. So the aerosol optical depth can have a different value under different water vapor conditions in the atmosphere. Aerosol optical depth actually represent all size of particle in the atmosphere, whereas PM2.5 restrict to the aerosol particle less than 2.5 micrometer in aerodynamic diameter at the surface level. So there are differences between these two quantities. And so how, how we can actually extract PM2.5 or estimate PM2.5 from the AOD. <clears throat> these are some of the models from early days. In early 2000s, people started realizing that we can actually use this aerosol optical depth <coughs> to extract either PM10 or PM2.5. And these, the first thing people started doing is plotting the two parameters on a scatter plot. And what you see here is aerosol optical depth plotted against PM10, an exercise in Italy over Aeronet site, uh, and that shows a high degree of correlation of 0.8. And that gives some indication that yes, aerosol optical depth 
contained information about this PM10. At the same time, there was another study published in US which used PM2.5 instead of PM10, and th they did the similar uh, correlation analysis and found the correlation of 0.7 with the scattered in the two data sets. But this early example shows that if you have aerosol optical depth data, then with certain error margin, you can estimate the PM2.5 using a simple linear regression equation where you have a slope and intercept between these two quantity, which can be used to estimate PM2.5. The other applications, people, uh, this is one of the early studies where uh, we have looked the impact of fire on local air quality and what you see on the left side is the surface PM2.5 measured in Sydney, Australia, uh, over several stations and the aerosol optical depth on the right side from the satellite. And it's very simple visualization that's showing that the two quantity, although they are, there are differences as we discussed earlier, uh, are able to track the impact of a smoke coming out of those fires uh, over different locations. Both shows high values during the fires and low values uh, before and after fires in the outer region. So again, this is a, another indication that EOD from the satellite does contain information on the PM2.5 and can be used as surrogate or approximate to estimate surface level PM2.5. This is another example where you can actually look the long-term trends uh, in air quality or surface level pollution in regions where you do not have any surface measurements. Uh, this is just showing a study from the northeast US showing on the top surface measurement from all the way from 2003 to 2014 and you can see the ground station shows about 35 percent reduction in PM2.5 and if you look the same uh, same region from the satellite uh, in terms of aerosol optical depth you get about 30 percent reduction in aerosol optical depth so again over the longer time period the two quantity being different, but they are tracking the same loading of the aerosols in the atmosphere and showing the long-term trend uh, approximately in the same numbers. Uh, this may not be true at the every single place you look. Uh, this is just one example, but you will be able to perform some of this analysis using some of the tools which we will do in week two and three. Another example of long-range transport, uh, dust coming out from Asia or Africa, fire uh, smoke transporting uh, either this is just uh, example uh, the smoke coming out from the fires in Australia transporting all around the world in 10 to 11 days and reaching back to the Australia so these are some of this example uh, where satellite data really helps uh, this is very very difficult to do it from the ground measurement and as you put the ground measure, ground instrument on the entire path of those uh, you know, transport, but you can look this from the space and make a composite image and quantify the impact of those long range transport in the local air quality and the regional air quality. Uh, another very good example of this is, uh, where you can use these tools and data is to compare with the models, how your model is performing against what satellite is making measurement. Uh, there will be differences, there will be which will help you to understand the. Uh, the performance of the model and sometime you can actually include the satellite data in the model through the data simulation to improve the accuracy of the model. And again, these type of maps you will be able to do using uh, Python script which, which we'll provide in week two and three. Uh, uh, this is another example where satellite data are used uh, to uh, oil to to actually study oil and natural gas activities and their impact on the loading of uh, uh, NO2 in this case. So these are the two examples from North Dakota on the top where the, uh, if you see on the right, there's a night light images from Weir satellite where you can see that there's a lot of lights shown in the circles. And if you go there, there will not too many lights, but what is Weir is looking is flames coming out from this oil on natural gas activities. Similar example can be seen in the taxes and all other parts of the world. Uh, and this kind of uh, activities have been observed using both NO2 and VS nightlight data. Uh, 
This is another example uh, of long-term trend analysis of NO2 over the United States. So this map shows a animation from 2005 to 2012. Uh, the high values are for 2005, and as you go uh, as towards 2012 and 2014, you will start seeing those low uh, NO, NO2 has been reduced. Some of the studies have actually demonstrated that the NO2 in this part of the world has gone 50 to 70 percent uh, during that time period. So this is a really remarkable uh, demonstration of the use of satellite data uh, for real type, uh, real life air quality application. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, the validation of satellite data is really, really a critical part uh, in satellite remote sensing and applications. So here, this study has shown that what satellite make measurements uh, in terms of, um, this is again o NO2 validation studies over the United States, where NO2 is also measured by the EPA from their air quality ground measurement stations. And when the, you compare the two uh, and find out the trends uh, over these station, you will see a similar numbers. Uh, on the top, you see the satellite-based numbers. And on the bottom, you see surface-based numbers. And you, you can see carefully that uh, many stations show very similar trends uh, from the two different measurements. Uh, and also note down the please the units are different. What satellite is providing is molecules per centimeter square, whereas what AQS is providing is PPV, and there are ways to convert uh, from one to another. Okay, so there are, like I said, these are some of the applications, some of the analysis which you will be able to perform using some of those Python codes. Uh, but in week two, we will focus on the MODIS aerosol products. So I want to go a little bit on how those aerosol products are derived, and then we'll go through an exercise to download this aerosol product. So very briefly, optical depth, as you know, is the quantity of light removed from beam of uh, by scattering or absorption by these particles in the atmosphere. And on the left side, you can see that this incoming solar light which passes through this atmosphere where you have a clouds, aerosols, stress gases, water vapors, and all of the component in the atmospheres. And when this light interacts with these aerosol particles in cloud-free condition, it either get scattered or absorbed depending on the properties of those aerosols. And then there are sun photometers sitting on the ground, which I showed earlier as Aeronet network. There are commercially available sun photometers called microtops. And then the similar quantity is also measured by the satellite. So if you look this aerosol optical depth, the first these, mes these measurements are made to get the total optical depth of the atmosphere, which is represented in this equation as total optical depth is the Rayleigh optical depth, which is air molecules, NO2, uh, the nitrogen and oxygen and other trace gases in the atmospheres, which we can calculate to theoretically very accurately based on the uh, air pressure in the atmosphere and com uh, different composition of those stress, uh, those gases in the atmospheres. The aerosol optical depth is the one which we are looking for and then the gases absorption. So this is gas absorption optical depth is basically ammonia, water vapor, CO and all other gases which specifically absorbs or um, uh, light in those particular spectral channel in which we are going to make this aerosol optical. Optical depth is a unitless quantity. It is represented always on a specific wavelength. So it can the value of optical depth can change depending on which wavelength you are making measurement. The most common wavelength in which optical depth is reported is 550, which is a green band and solar spectrum. And that's what we are going to use. This is a uh, sensor which I have been talking earlier. It's called MODIS, MODIS Moderate Resolution Image Spectro, Spectro Radiometer. Uh, the data sets from this MODIS sensor available from starting from the 2000. There are two MODIS sensors in orbit. One takes measurements in the morning, one in the afternoon. And if you have gone through those fundamentals, you will see more information on that. The spatial resolution of this sensor is start from 250 meter all the way to one kilometer, depending on which wavelength you are looking. There are 36 different wavelengths in which the measurements are provided. 
So aerosol detection, the aerosol optical depth retrieval is start with the aerosol detection in the image. Uh, this is a very simple image where you can see different, four different broad classes of uh, features in this image. You can see land, you can see clear water, you can see some smoke coming out of the fire and there are some clouds. So this is really very selected clean image where you can see distinct features. And this is ideal for aerosol retrieval uh, because you really do not have to do much in this and your aerosols can be easily detected and retrieved. But this is not often the case. Often we encounter things like this where aerosols are mixed with cloud, they are above the cloud, they are below the cloud. Uh, it's very, very, uh, becomes very hard to actually separate signal from aerosols and cloud. And that's where we have to rely on this spectral information. That is why MODIS make measurement in so many spectral channels so that we can actually use information in different channels to separate this different atmospheric and land and ocean features in the image to extract the information which we are looking for. In this case, aerosol optical depth. So once you have this radiance measurement, it, we convert that in aerosol product which is aerosol optical depth, and in, in this example, you are just seeing an example of this fires, uh, the smoke coming out of this fires, and the black area on the right shows, shows that the satellite retrieval algorithm is not providing aerosol optical depth uh, due to other reasons, like either it's clouds, either it's too bright, or the algorithm actually failed to separate aerosols from the cloud, and that you can see actually as a gap in the thick plume of smoke just near the source of the fires. So again, these are all the details which we talk in the fundamental course um, and um, I hope you have gone through those so you will understand that much better. We will talk a little bit more about these things in week two when we start using the programs. If you are more interested in learning about retrieval algorithm, there's a paper by Ramar et al. 2005. It's a really nicely written paper. Explain very well how aerosol remote sensing works. And then this is a complicated chart which I have given you for a reference, um, which actually explains essentially entire algorithm uh, starting from the aerosol detections to the aerosol optical depth. So it's a complex algorithm. Uh, if you are interested, please go through this paper which I have listed here. In case of MODIS, there are two different algorithms. One is called dark target, which works both over land and ocean. But it, as the name suggests, it only works over dark vegetated areas. The deep blue algorithm is a relatively new algorithm. It works over bright surfaces. In recent uh, data sets released, Deep Blue also works over other vegetated areas. So now you have it. two options to get the product. And when we talk in next week, we'll talk about the uh, uh, specific data parameter which you can actually extract to either to select Dark Target or Deep Blue or the combined product. The latest release of the data sets comes in called Collection 6.1. Uh, and there is a joint product which combine both dark target and deep blue uh, in that release of the data. This is just an example showing the coverage of uh, three different uh, product which we will look into week two. Uh, on the top you see an RGV where you can see a lot of clouds, land, aerosol features. And when you start using those uh, radiance measured in that RGV to go through this algorithm, the dark target algorithm produced this map which is on the extreme left and you can see a lot of white areas which is either not retrieved uh, due to the high surface reflectivity or the cloud detection. Deep blue you will see that it's much more covered area because it actually can retrieve aerosols in bright areas so therefore Western US and mid US is considered as more bright surface, so you will see more coverage from the deep blue. And there is a combined product uh, called, which is in between uh, from dark target and deep blue in terms of the coverage, and that actually, we will talk about that specific parameter in week two, why the coverage is actually lower than the deep blue, because uh, they only pick the highest quality of the data. 
there are other product uh, which are at higher resolution uh, so initially the product was developed at 10 kilometer but uh, over the time uh, modis has a three kilometer product and the advantage of three kilometer product is that you can see some small scale features which is very difficult to see in the 10 kilometer product and to make things more interesting there is a one kilometer product which is in process right now it will release soon uh, it's called Mayak uh, and this example actually is just to demonstrate the, the power of high resolution data set so on the RGB it's very hard but if you can see uh, on the east coast of US there are smoke plumes from the small, small fires and if you look the 10 kilometer AOD product you really don't see those signals in that image everything looks very smooth uh, uh, homogeneous special features three kilometer product starts showing some high signal in the some of those smoke plume but it's still very difficult uh, to see them but if you look the one kilometer product and you look a little bit more in depth then you can see some reds and greens dots and those are basically smoke coming out of those from small fires so this is really if you have this high resolution product it really helps you to uh, identify the small sources on the ground which cannot be detected in the 10 kilometer or 3 kilometer product this is a reference table uh, just to show uh, apart from modis there are other sensors which provide aerosol product each sensors have their own limitations advantages and this table provides all those details there are high resolution product up to 70 750 meter resolution from the views uh, which can be used for air quality applications okay the next one is the OMI uh, OMI provides uh, trace gas measurements along with aerosols products and it was again launched in early 2004 uh, it operates in UV part of solar spectrum. The wavelengths start from 270 to 500 nanometer. It's a hyperspectral instrument so that you can actually look the fine absorption line by different trace gases in the atmosphere. And that allow us to actually quantify the amount of NO2, SO2, ozone, and formaldehyde, and methane, and other uh, trace gases. Uh, the spatial resolution is coarse compared to MODIS. It's 13 by 24 square, uh, square kilometer, and it does provide a daily global coverage. Uh, this is just showing uh, how the data of uh, uh, OMI sensors comes into. They are about 14 to 15 granules or orbits per day. Uh, each uh, granules provide the complete one orbit from the satellite. Uh, you can see an example on the right showing. Uh, it's about it takes about 90 minutes for the satellite to cover that entire orbit and you can see on the pole there's a lot more coverage as compared to uh, the tropics and other uh, other regions in the world so there are 14 to 15 such orbits every single day which cover entire globe OMI has suffered uh, uh, something called a row anomaly it's in a defect on the it, it it's 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 a mechanical problem with the instrument which started sometime in early 2008 uh, where actually because of that you lose about 50 percent of the data so if you look this on the left side this is 2006 image and on the right side is 2010 image just one day showing the loss of coverage due to this row anomaly and remember this loss is will be in coverage will be different in different latitude of the uh, globe so at high latitude the loss will be lower at tropics where already the coverage is limited you will see much more loss in the data so this is very important aspect to remember when you start using OMI data that it does lose uh, it has lost some of the data due to this row anomaly effect this is a this is these are the two quantities which we are going to use in week three NO2 and SO2 to look into the data SO2s are provided in the Dobson unit NO2s are provided in molecules per centimeter square you can convert from one to another and these are uh, we will talk about that more in week three actually when we start using the data some of the references uh, related to this 
uh, air quality page on the offset website. This is another NASA, asset, NASA air quality page where you will see a lot of NO2 data from cities and from uh, different parts of the world. MODIS atmospheric site provide a lot of information on MODIS aerosol product and all other atmospheric product and then the OMI data can be obtained through this website. Okay, so let me have a quick break here of a minute and then we'll I pop up a couple of poll question here and then we will go through some of the preparation for week two and we'll download some of the some of the data. Okay, so I'm going to show some polls here and then uh, for each question you will get 30 seconds to respond and then we'll go over some of the details which you will require for week two and download some data uh, which we'll use in week two. So the first question is have you ever used any data sets from either MODIS or OMI? Okay, so we have about 80% responded and the answer is just pretty good. 60% people have used, so that is a good sign that you will get some more added uh, tools to play with these two data sets. People who have not used the data, uh, you will get some head start on how to use these data sets for your applications and research. Okay, another question. And this is question on just what I presented. So aerosol optical depth, AOD or AOT, represents loading of aerosol particles in the atmospheric layer close to the surface. The answer is true or false. It should be or yes or no. Okay, so we have 76% people responded and things are divided here. And that shows me that you have not gone through the fundamental of remote sensing. <laughs> Please do that because this is really, really important. If you want to use the satellite data, it is very important to understand what that quantity means. If you don't understand, then it will, you will end up in using it wrong way and that's not good. So please do go through the fundamental. If I have also explained this actually during this presentation. So please go over the recording when it is posted or try to read some of those uh, reference material. Aerosol optical depth is an optical quantity. It's a unitless quantity represented on a specific wavelength and it represents the entire column of the atmosphere from the surface to the top of the atmosphere. It does not represent only near the surface. Whereas PM2.5 is measured at the surface and represent mass concentration for particular size range of particles in the atmosphere. So this is really, really important if you want to start using the satellite data to understand this application. Okay, uh, next one, which is very simple. And this is just, I want to get a feeling of whether you are interested in air quality application over land or ocean. Okay, so only 4% people are interested in our ocean. Uh, I, mean, I know there are certain agencies which likes to monitor uh, air quality over ocean for various regions, and this is what I expected. Most people are interested in our land, so no surprise. Okay, let's go back to our presentation. And uh, <coughs> there are a few things, and I think a lot of people also have questions on that. Uh, I want to just go through those very quickly here and then we'll go through the data download exercise. 
So please make sure we are going to use Python 2.7 using Anaconda, which is an, a package to install Python either on your any operating system computer. It can do on a Mac, Linux, or Windows. In week two, to give you a flavor of different operating system, in week two, we'll present everything from a Mac-based, uh, Apple-based computer. And whereas in week three, we'll present actually from window-based computers. So you get a feeling, I'm sure there are, uh, okay, so, the session two will be Mac based. Session three, which is on Monday, uh, uh, will be a window based too, so that we can actually, I'm sure there are a mix of users who use either Mac or Windows or Linux. Uh, Linux users will have very similar uh, configuration as Mac, uh, so they, they are already covered. So, this package, we have a package list to be installed along with the Python. Uh, some of that comes with the Anaconda by default, uh, but it is always good to check it. Some of the, uh, these you will have to install. For example, PyHDF, H5PY, and the Matplot, and few of these you need to install them. Okay, so on our website, we have a, we have prepared a test code if your installation have all the modules which is required for this course, and if you run this test Python, then it should run without any error and it will produce in an image. So if you have gone through that step, it means you're all set for week two and week three. If you are getting any error in that test code, or it is complaining that the certain package is not installed on your, please, Try to search online for resources. Uh, Sometimes PyHDF can be difficult to install depending on what you're following. Uh, so please spend some time, look around. There are solutions online. Uh, and if you, have, if you have all the permissions, uh, uh, administrative permission on your computer, then it should not be difficult to install it. For week two, we have also provided uh, modest data and the Python code. Uh, there are five different uh, Python script which we will go over in week two, which are provided as one single package and that can be actually downloaded from, from the uh, training page. And if you are really interested to learn a little bit more, we have some additional codes and documentation readme again on our RSET website, which the link has given on the bottom, uh, please go over that link as well. Uh, this is the test code. Uh, it, it basically loads or imports all the package which we required. Uh, and in this specific code, we are actually reading one modus granule file, which is also provided as part of that package. And if you run that code, then you will be seeing image like this on the right side as shown as the output. So please uh, go through that step uh, before uh, we start uh, next session on Friday uh, where we'll actually go through some of those codes to read and map the data. So this is an essential part. To do, to go through the next uh, Next session, we will use modus 10 kilometer and 30 kilometer household parameters in order to get the data. Uh, we are going to use the Lex Web Earth Data Logging. Uh, as have been instructed, you must register with Earth Data. It required login and password to download the data. If you have not done so, please check your emails. Uh, we have provided details information. And if you are, if you don't have, there is a exercise, uh, there is a PPT here which shows step by step how to actually download this data from the LATS web, including the Earth data login. And we'll go over that here in a minute. These are the data sets, case studies, which we have suggested. How to use exactly the same thing. We will be using these to demonstrate some of the code capabilities but feel free to 
select other dates, other case uh, time frame or other part of the region to download your own data set. So these are just suggestions and this is what we are going to run uh, through if you just want to run through uh, and understand the outputs of the data. I would strongly recommend you stick with these. Going to show from our side and that will confirm that your code is running properly and you are getting similar results. Okay, so let's go over some of the data download exercise which we are talking about. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to go rather quickly on that. If you have not, uh, if you have trouble, there is a uh, exercise slide on our web page. It's called exercise, both in Spanish and English. Uh, it has a step-by-step -step, uh, instruction on how to download. So the first thing, I will just go on the Google and type Let's Web NASA. That should give me the first link, which will take me to this website. And if you have not registered with the uh, this application, uh, which was instructed uh, in your PPT uh, presentation, so please do that. Once you are on this website, click on the Find Data. When you click on the find data, you see this page where you have the product, time, location, files, reviewers on the top. And on the left, there are other options which you can explore in your own time. We are not going to go through those, uh, but if you have questions on those, uh, we will be able to answer after this session. So the first thing is you select a sensor. In order to select, click on the select a sensor on the left side of the menu and then we will select Modis Aqua. Once you select the sensor, it will start showing a lot of parameters, a lot of product names. On the left side, all the there are 57 different products. On the right side as the product name. We need aerosols. So we'll click on aerosols so that it will the list is shorted now. Now we have only MYD04, which is three kilometer product and MYD04 underscore A2, which is a 10 club product. So you click on those two on the right side and it will start showing up in your product collection on the left side here. Once you did that, you click either on the arrow on the extreme right or you click on is to select the date range or a specific date for which you want to download the data. And there are various options here. I will just use the default and I want the data from 2017 October 8 to 2017 October 9. I want the data for these two dates. And I say add that date. Once you add the date, you will see on the right side date selection. If you have different sets of date, different days, you can do multiple times here and then it will show up as date selection. It can search all the dates in one shot so you don't have to do it. For this exercise, we'll just stick with these two days, dates. And then again, go to the rightmost arrow and click on that arrow. Now it will bring you to the select the location where you want to download the data. So you, there are many different options to select the location. You can select by countries, you can select by tiles. There are validation sites. Validation sites are those Aeronet sites. So you can download the data on a specific validation site as well. You can draw the box. So, or you can enter the coordinate manually here in this box in different formats as prescribed here. We will use the draw the box features. To do that, first you can draw a box on any side. In order to actually select the area, first I will move the map around and then zoom it a little bit so that I can select the area. I can see the area where I want to get my data more 
So I want the data over Bay Area and California in US. So I will draw. Now I will click on the draw custom box and then I will draw a bigger box here over California. Once you draw that box, it automatically saves those lat long boundaries, which actually you can see the current selection on the right side, select area interest tab. Now again, go to rightmost and click that A arrow. Once you click that, it will show the results from those search. So it shows eight different files. Four files are Modis Aqua, 10 kilometer product, all underscore L2 is 10 kilometer product, and underscore 3K is 3 kilometer product. So there are eight different files on those two days which were actually uh, falling on that region on those two days. If you want, you can see a vertical column says image. And if you click on that image, you will notice those image option is only available for 10 kilometer product. It's not available for three kilometer product. And you can click on those image. And what you will see is the aerosol optical depth map for that particular granule which you have selected. It's color coded with the scale from zero to one. So this is from the October 8. And we will make exactly the same map using the Python script. You can actually select different file on the right side and your map will change. And this is October 9 when the fire was started and you can see very high value of aerosol optical depth shown as red color in this map. And these are the maps which we will actually draw in week two. Okay, so once you have done played with this, it also, if you go on the bottom, it also shows a map. And that map actually shows, if you click on different granules, different file, the box on the map moves. And that is showing the locations on the global map where this data is taken. Uh, you can actually save these images as PNG also, if you want to compare with your Python code. Uh, if not, that is fine. Once you go, you can actually go back and go to the files here. Click on the right size. There is a button called files. You will get back to your original. Now, the next one is you have to select. You can either select individual files and download directly from here. Like if I click on this file and say, there is a button called download on the extreme right. If I click on that, it will start downloading on my computer like this. Uh, sometimes it might ask for the directory depending on what setting you have on your computer. You can also select all and it will select all. Once you select all, you will notice on the top right the number five review and order actually tab activated. If you don't select, then that tab is not activated. If you select all, the tab is activated. Once that tab is activated, you can click on that or you can click on that, that right side arrow. Once you click on that arrow, it, if you have not logged in, it will ask to log in or uh, other data login. I was not logged in, so it asked me my password and usernames are already saved. If you have not saved, you can save it or you can enter it manually and I say log in. Once I say login and everything is set, it shows the file summaries. There are two product, four files for three kilometer, four files for 10 kilometer product. Now, there are many different options. Uh, again, I would recommend you to pro, uh, explore these options in your own time. But in, uh, since we don't have a lot of time now, we will just say submit order. The green button on the right side in the bottom which says submit button. If you click on that, it will send you an email which you have used to register on earth data with all the instruction 
on how to download the data. If your data volume is not very large, you will get instant email to download the data. If your data volume is large, it might take some processing time. So for example, in this case, due to whatever reason it says, it may take five minutes, 10 plus days, but that's not the case. You usually get in few minutes, most often. I can say click here to continue and I'll check my email and you will see an email with all the instruction on how to download data. If my recommendation, if you are only interested in downloading two <coughs> files, one, two, five, even 10, I would just go to that file list here and start downloading the data. Right now it doesn't show because I already, it, it has gone through. I can actually look my past order here on the left side window. There, is, there are different buttons here. On the left side, one of them says past orders, which is the last one in the list. And you can see all my past order. I can click on my this recent order. This will show all the details here. I can reorder. I can see where those files are. And it will do something, which I don't know what it is doing, but it will show you eventually images or the files which you have actually selected. If you have trouble in downloading, please go to this uh, RSET page and we have a exercise which is essentially same step-by-step -step instructions as I have presented here. So you can go over that and you should be able to download the data. Okay, with that, I think I am ready to to take question answers. Okay, so uh, you can see a, a document here where all the questions have been posted. So you can actually read the questions and I will pick some of the question and we'll start answering uh, as we go through this uh, document. So these are the question which you have posted them here. So the first question, how can I download the Aronite data? The website has been given there. Uh, it's very straightforward. Just go to that website and you can actually download the data over individual station. You can download the data, all the station together, a specific time period. There are various options. Uh, and if you look through our RSET website, we also have an exercise uh, which we can put uh, a link here later, at a later point. Another question is, can Aronet data be available and used by themselves without satellite data? It looks like nice network by itself. Yes, yes, you can always use that and people do use it for many different applications, not just air quality, but climate applications and all other. Uh, it has been used for a wide range of applications. Do you know if you can apply the same MODIS AOD models, which I believe you mean algorithms to lens that it. Yes, there have been some attempt. Uh, there are some similarities between Landsat 8 and 9 uh, channels and MODIS channel, which we use to retrieve aerosol optical depth. And there have been some attempt at research level, but there is no operational aerosol optical depth product from any of the Landsat series of satellite. Uh, it is very high resolution, so there are uh, there are issues which needs to be addressed uh, and people have done at research level. Okay, how do you tell apart the biomass burning from haze or dust pollution? So the question is basically, how you distinguish between different types of aerosols or different types of particles coming out from different source, either from fires or from industry or dust. How do you, so the, the strength of satellite data is that in case of MODIS, we have this 36 different spectral channels. And each type of these particles, uh, it's biomass burning particles or haze or dust, 
or sea salt or cloud, they respond little bit differently to different spectral channels. And once we start looking signal in different spectral channel, we can actually, up to some extent, we can distinguish between these different particles. It is not always possible to actually separate them because you can separate biomass burning if there is a huge event and there's no other aerosol type present there, then you can separate them very clearly. But in an environment where they are mixed together, it's very, very hard to do just alone from the satellite measurement. There are other advanced techniques like polarizations, uh, which can help, but we have very limited observations of those things. Uh, those kind of measurements, but as satellite remote sensing is advancing in time, uh, we will have more capabilities to separate different types of aerosol and identify specific sources. Okay, so the next question is, how can you solve if your country do not have AOD station? Okay, so this is, uh, so there are, there are multiple options here. Either some countries do have their own aerosol network. Uh, for example, India has their own aerosol network. China has their own aerosol network. There are some other agencies other than NASA have their own network which, uh, which does cover multiple countries. So first option is to, again, go in, on internet, search for any other network which might have a station in your country. If you don't have anything, go to the Aeronet website. And if you are interested, there are contact information. Try to contact to them and ask them, and they might be able to interested in putting one station in your country if it satisfy their conditions. Okay, another question. Why most studies are limited to PM2.5 AOD relationship? Why not PM10 AOD? That's a very good question. So in recent uh, last two, three decades, uh, most health studies have actually focused that the PM2.5, which is a smaller range of size particles in the atmospheres, they are mostly come from anthropogenic activities, are more harmful to human health than the PM2.5, PM10, which was traditionally measured. PM10s are coarse particles. They are difficult to uh, go inside, penetrate your body. PM2.5 are smaller particles. They can easily go through your uh, through uh, in different part of your body and they are more harmful to the health. Uh, PM10 are also usually generated through more natural processes like dust storm, sea salt, uh, and other activities, whereas PM2.5 is more anthropogenic uh, particles. They can also be toxic in nature. So mostly because of their more severe health impact, PM2.5 are uh, uh, more uh, people have explored that more often. But it's not true that PM10 has been not explored uh, in terms of getting it from the aerosol optical depth. There have been a lot of studies, uh, specifically in China, some of the European countries, India, where PM2.5 measurements are not available, people have looked PM10 to extract from the AOD. Which website will be used to download the OMI data uh, that is given, I think, in the presentation. We will talk that more in week two also. Uh, it's Earth data this, uh, uh, which will be used uh, to get the OMI data. Uh, and we will actually go over that in week two a little bit to prepare for the week three. I have problem in acquiring AOD data because the study area is cloudy. This study area is located in Bogota in the country of Colombia. Yes, so there are certain regions all around the world where the cloud is persistent throughout the years and it might be difficult to pick actually cloud-free regions. So uh, one, one option is you go through some of those online tools like Worldview, which can help you to identify uh, clear area, clear areas and 
is uh, in over certain locations and then you pick that dates to download the data uh, other options uh, I have no idea what other options you can do if there is a cloud on that location persistently there is no option you can actually study aerosols as far as from the passive sensor there are active sensors like Calypso which can penetrate some of the cloud and can provide some aerosol information but it's very very limited coverage okay so next question is on python is it possible to use 3.6 and drop 2.7 in this webinar series the short answer is yes you can use uh, our codes have been primarily tested in 2.7. Some of them have been tested in 3.6, but we cannot debug during the webinar if you are having trouble. Uh, we have tested them in 2.7, and we know that it works. Uh, but I believe with very little modification, they should be able to work in 3.6 as well. Uh, but we will most likely in v Week three, uh, we will try to show 3.6 uh, uh, version so that you get an idea of what changes needs to make uh, in order to run uh, from 2.7 to 2. There are very minor changes which needs to be made actually, otherwise the code should work. Okay, yes, so uh, some people are having trouble in uh, installing some of the packages which are listed like calendar system and some of these. Most of these packages usually come as a default when you install the Python using Anaconda and if you are running the test code and if your code is working coming out without any error or complaining anything it means those packages are already installed and there are ways actually to check uh, if you just type uh, in your Python the name of package import that package and if it comes up with no error it means that package is available you can also list package so don't worry too much about those if your test code is running you are good to go okay uh, next question number 10 is it possible to combine the data from ground monitoring station with the satellite information the short answer is yes and we will go through an exercise in week two where we'll do the exactly the same thing can modest product be assist by some web service such as WMS or WFS services so Yes, you can access the MODIS uh, data using various web services. Uh, if you are more interested on that, uh, please shoot us an email and we will be able to provide you more details on that. Uh, you can also just uh, search online and you will find actually there are various web services through which you can access WMS and others uh, through which you can access the data and you can import on your own website, you can display it on your website. Or other applic or you can integrate with other online applications. Uh, okay, so there is a question: Are we going to go over how we can export this data into GeoTIFF and GIS applications? Uh, not in this webinar series. We are not going to go over that specific aspect, but if you go through the let's web exercise which we just gone through and at the end of the data ordering there is option called post processing of the data and if you go through that post processing there is an option to convert the HDF file into GeoTIFF which you can export or import in your GIS software so there is already an option available online to do that task uh, and it's under post-processing 
when you order the data through the Let's Web website. But in this uh, webinar series, we will not go over any Python script to handle the GeoTIFF. Okay, another question. Can we get SO2 PM 2.5 for each day? If there is missing data for some days, do we need to use some interpolation technique to fill the gaps? Yeah, this is uh, very, this really depends on what's your application. Yes, you will see data gaps either due to clouds, due to algorithm retrievals problems, or due to the instrument itself has some uh, row anomalies like I was showing in o case of OMI, you will see some data gaps. Now, there are various ways to fill some of the gaps. There are some statistical technique, interpolation techniques, you can use that, but it really depends on your application. What is your application and how you want to use the data? So I will not further comment on that because that's really very application specific question. Okay, uh, if we post process our HDF, which SDS will be appropriate for PM10? Uh, uh, we will actually talk about that in week two uh, when we start looking into the actual data. And at that point, uh, uh, we will describe or actually talk about various SDS within the HDF files. So I, I would say, please, Hold on until week two uh, on the post-processing part. What are the biggest source of errors in accurately quantifying PM2.5 from the satellite data? Okay, this is an uh, interesting question, and it really depends on many, many different parameters. Uh, some of them are related to the retrieval accuracies of aerosol optical depth itself. Some of them are related to the composition of PM2.5 PM particles in different part of the world. Some of them re uh, are related to the vertical distributions of aerosols or PM2.5 in the atmosphere itself. So it depends on where you are and what time frame you are, uh, what kind of aerosols you are dealing with, uh, those parameters will vary. But some of the and it goes back to the fundamental definition of these two particles, these two quantities. PM2.5 is a mass concentrations of particles which are smaller than 2.5 micrometer in aerodynamic diameters. Aerosol optical depth, on the other hand, represent all size of particle. So if you are in place and time where other size particles or larger size particles are dominating, then you will have large error in your PM2.5 estimation from aerosol optical depth because most signal will come from the large particles and you will have difficulty. If you are in place and time where there are multiple layers of aerosols in the atmospheres, so you have a surface layer and then there are layers of aerosols in one kilometer and three kilometer and five kilometers, either due to the long range transport or specific aerosol event, the aerosol optical depth will, signal will be contributed from all of those layer, whereas PM2.5 will be just representing the surface, so you will have large error in those cases as well. If you have uh, aerosols uh, really very close to the, uh, Usually it happens in winter time, very close to the surface. Most of the aerosols are accumulated in the lower lower regions of the atmosphere, lower layer of the atmosphere, 100 meter or so. Usually it happens during the early mornings of winters in many parts of the world. During that time, satellite will have very less sensitivity to see those aerosol particles. And that can be another source of error in your estimations. Uh, there are other uh, uh, regions high relative humidity conditions in hygroscopic aerosol environment, you will see uh, large errors when you estimate PM2.5 from AOD. So it really varies a lot depending on what you are trying to do and where you are trying to do and where. Okay. Uh, 
have you processed images from sentinel p5 precursors to measure air quality <coughs> short answer is no uh, i believe you are asked you are talking about the TROP OMI, uh, which has been recently launched satellite. Um, the data has not been yet released from the European agency, so we haven't processed any of that. Can you automate the data download process through API? Yes, there are various options on the Let's Web. Uh, there is an OpenDAP server which you can use to access directly data. There are HTTP servers to download the data. There are FTP servers to download the data, uh, and you can automate. Uh, you can write a little script and automate that process easily. Can we use MODIS AOD and Aeronet data to validate WAF cam aerosol simulations? The uh, you can use the Aeronet data to validate. Uh, MODIS data you can use to compare it because MODIS data are not considered as ground truth. Aeronet data is considered as ground truth. So when we talk about validation, it means that we are comparing with something which is true in nature. So Aeronet data are ground truth. You can validate, but you can also compare the MODIS data to see the special features to get the feeling of how overall performance or the consistency between WARFCAM and MODIS. What would be the threshold of correlation between AOD and PM2.5 for validating the AOD product? Okay, so this is so in, if you want to validate the AOD product, you have to use the another AOD product. In case we are use the Aeronet AOD, so when you uh, validate the AOD product, you use the same parameter. What you are asking is probably what is the threshold of correlation to get good estimation of PM2.5 from AOD. Uh, in that uh, is also again really depends on your application, how much tolerance level you can sustain in your estimated PM2.5. Sometimes correlation of 0.5 can do the job, sometimes correlation of 0.9 can also not do the job. It really depends on what is your tolerance levels in terms of the uncertainty in PM2.5. Is it 5% accurate you want, 10% accurate you want, 30%, 40% depend on your application. So it, it varies. It, there's no one answer for that uh, estimation. Can you tell us the important application of air quality monitoring over oceans? Uh, so uh, as you know, over ocean, uh, there are many different sources of uh, uh, pollution or, air, or the aerosol particles. One major is the uh, sea salt particles, which comes out from the oceans as uh, winds blows over the ocean surface. Those are the main. But there are other transport from the land, like dust, biomass burning, smoke, or even pollution from the industry that transport over ocean. There are other source on the ocean also like uh, smoke coming out from the big ships. There are gas and oil drilling in the, over the ocean which puts out a lot of uh, pollution in the uh, over ocean. There are uh, aircraft emissions and other things. So those, if, if certain, certain agencies do required to monitor label of pollution over ocean, most of the time they are near the land boundaries. Um, and if you are more interested in monitoring aerosols, most often people actually monitor aerosols over ocean to address some of the climate application questions. How the radiative uh, forcing is changing over oceans or how uh, it is impacting overall uh, outgoing solar radiation or incoming uh, outgoing solar radiation or outgoing earth radiation over ocean. So to address some of the climate application, most people often use uh, uh, aerosols data over ocean. Not so much for the air quality. Okay, is it possible to transport PM2.5 modis data to smoke to process it to... Okay, so this, I believe the smoke, uh, it's question 22, the question is, can you import, can you include the MODIS PM2.5 data to 
CMAC model uh, to get the emissions. Uh, and I think the smoke is a model within comes with CMAC, which uh, creates uh, emission data sets. Uh, short answer is yes, but I do not know all the details about how you will do it. Okay, next question 23. Fog is a special cloud on the ground that is highly affected by aerosols close to the surface. I'm interested in identifying the and analyzing the presence, occurrence, and dynamics of fog in tropic Edens, Andes. Is there any algorithm product from NASA focused on this fog issue? So NASA, I believe, does not have any fog product, operational fog product, but there have been research studies people have published uh, and there are methods people have developed based on the spectral thresholds of different uh, modus channel, which can be used to actually detect and monitor fires uh, over different locations. Uh, if you are really interested, please again write uh, an email to me. I can uh, I can suggest some reference paper where people have demonstrated those techniques. Uh, but I do not remember on top of my head right now. But the, and I don't think there is a uh, there is an operational product from any of the satellite. Uh, uh, goes I am not sure. Uh, so. Please check the GOES satellite, which is from the NOAA, uh, goes R. It might have a FOG product over US, uh, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay, next question. Okay, this has been already answered, question 24. What is the diff question 25? What is the difference between normalized difference aerosol index and PM2.8 equation? Okay, I'm not sure what is normalized difference aerosol index. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. There is a NOAA product, something like that, but I'm not 100% sure. That might be from VIRS, so I'll just say I don't know that. <laughs> Can we directly use OMID data and MODIS data without any correction? Again, uh, short answer is yes. All the data are already corrected for any correction needed. So you can use directly, but again, it will depend on your applications uh, and how accurate data you want. If you need more accurate data, then you might need to make some correction. If you don't need more accurate data, you can, you can tolerate the accuracy levels which are given with the data or uncertainty level, then you can actually use as it is. And we'll go over this, some of this. Uh, uh, there are, each products come with, with a quality flag, which tells about the uncertainty levels. And we'll go over that when we start running those codes in week two and three. Okay, so question 27, is MODIS data for PM2.5 available for one kilometer resolution? I would like to use it to evaluate CMAC results for PM2.5 in one kilometer over Western US. So there is a data set available at one kilometer special resolution. It's annual mean, and it's not a NASA product. It's out from the Dalhousie University. Uh, there's a group, uh, called Atmospheric Chemistry Group uh, led by Randall Martin. They have a one kilometer product over US and other parts of the uh, world, uh, but it's annual mean number. It's not available daily, monthly, or seasonal. It's annual mean numbers. You can use that. Uh, again, it's not, not an official NASA product, but they use NASA data, uh, satellite data to create that product. Uh, can we work on a regional scale for example, Nagpur city, Maharashtra to extract AOD over CT using satellite data? Yes, you could do that. And we will actually do that exact same exercise in week two. 
is PM 2.5 has an impact on occurrence of Western disturbance dynamics activity in Western Himalay. I'm not really sure what that means. So I'll say I don't know anything about that. Okay, I think uh, that's all for today. Uh, again, if you have more specific question, feel free to email us. We might respond. We might respond some of those questions in week two. Uh, again, go through some of those suggested exercise uh, for to, in order to prepare for week two. Uh, in week two, we'll go over uh, Python script. We'll take a lot of time. It's a two-hour session, so we will. We want to make sure everybody is able to run those codes. So please make sure you have installed Python. Your test code is running. You have all the data and codes on your computer ready to go. Uh, otherwise, we will not be able to actually debug code or debug the Python installation in the week two when the session is in pro progress. So please make sure you have all those things in place before we start looking the data in week two. With that. Thank you everyone for joining and we will see on Friday, same time for two hours.